Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Dahlgren Chapel of the Sacred Heart, here the spiritual heart of our Georgetown University community. We welcome all of our friends and colleagues who are watching through streaming. Uh, this will be a taped um, event. My name is Father Mark Bosco, the Vice President for Mission and Ministry. And on behalf of the university and President DeJoya, I wish to thank you for joining us for our Dahlgren Chapel Sacred Lecture Series. Today, we're honored to have with us Lisa Fulham, Professor Emerita of Moral Theology at the Jesuit School of Theology of Santa Clara, who continues right now her work as a veterinarian in upstate New York. Lisa, welcome, and thank you for being with us. The Dahlgren Sacred Lecture Series was inaugurated in 2014 after the completion of the renovations of this beautiful chapel dedicated to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. With these sacred lectures, we continue a Jesuit tradition practiced by Ignatius of Loyola and his early companions. They would offer lectures outside the context of the liturgy with the intent to inform and edify those seeking to grow in faith, hope, and love. Their sacred lectures dealt with scripture, but also engaged with issues of the moral life, with prayer, with the person of Christ, and the challenges one encounters in living out the gospel in everyday life. Meant to be accessible to a wider audience, these lectures were a staple of early Jesuit pastoral practice. So in that same spirit and in that style, we've adapted that tradition to meet the needs of our current moment, seeking out distinguished speakers engaged with a range of topics related to spirituality, social justice, and the Jesuit intellectual and artistic tradition. Some of our guests have included the Catholic novelist, Alice McDermott, the Jesuit historian and friend to all of us, Father John O'Malley, Sister Simone Campbell of the Network for Social, Catholic Social Justice, our own president George, of Georgetown, John DeJoya, and I think I saw Father Brian McDermott here who was last semester's uh, uh, lecture uh, for, for this series. Let me introduce Lisa Fulham then. She's joined the faculty of the Jesuit School of Theology in 2003 as professor of moral theology. And in this capacity, she taught courses in fundamental moral theology, sexual ethics, Martin Luther and St. Ignatius of Loyola, the spirituality of pastoral ministry, and issues in virtue ethics. Her research is centered on Thomas Aquinas, biomedical ethics, Ignatian spirituality, and the relationship of spirituality and ethics. Lisa's sacred lecture is entitled, Not Law, But Grace. We hear Luther in there. Not Law, But Grace, Probabilism, and the Freedom of Christian Conscience. The word probabilism is probably new to many of us here this afternoon, but it has roots in ancient Greek philosophy. It was formulated within Catholic theology in 1577 by the Dominicans and often was nurtured, taught, and defended by Jesuit theologians and, philosoph and philosophers in our schools. Well, we are so grateful that Lisa is here with us to deepen our understanding. Thank you again for honoring us with your presence and with your reflections. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lisa Fulham. Good afternoon. I'd like to start by offering a word of thanks for myself too. I am delighted to be here with you today in this beautiful chapel and, um, uh, and let's get to it. Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans, you are not under law, but grace. Paul's agenda here is sweeping. God's plan of salvation embraces all. In fact, that letter is punctuated with the words all and every, all throughout it. You are not under law, but grace. Now, when you think about moral theology in Catholic tradition, is grace the first thing you think about? Not likely. In fact, if you scroll through the indexes of moral theology texts, as one does, you'll be hard pressed to find grace at all. Sin, sure. And then pick an issue and you can probably find a, a, a good description of how that's been worked out in our tradition. Here's what I'd like to do this afternoon. 
I want to start with a review of certain aspects of Catholic tradition on conscience, and I want to emphasize how it is both a process of human reason and connected to what Paul calls in this letter to the Romans, the law written on the heart to which conscience bears witness. Conscience is a spiritual as well as a rational capacity. Then, I want to invite you in doing some serious geeking out over an underappreciated resource in moral theology, probabilism. I think we'd do well in our divided times if we retrieve probabilism as a tool in moral discourse in the church. And finally, who cares? What's so important about picking up this, uh, this uh, tradition of probabilism now? So, conscience. This is a familiar passage, I'm sure, from the Vatican II document, Gaudium et Spes. I adjust here for inclusive language. There were no women in the 1960s, apparently. <laughs> Deep within our conscience, we discover a law which we have not laid upon ourselves, but which we must obey. Its voice, ever calling us to love and do what is good and avoid evil, tells us inwardly at the right moment do this, shun that. For we have in our heart a law inscribed by God. Our dignity lies in observing this law, and by it we will be judged. Our conscience is our most secret core and sanctuary. There we are alone with God, whose voice echoes in our depths. By conscience, in a wonderful way, that law is made known, which is fulfilled in love of God and one's neighbor. Through loyalty to conscience, Christians are joined to others in the search for truth and the right solution to so many moral problems which arise both in the lives of individuals and in social relationships. Hence, the more a correct conscience prevails, the more do persons and groups turn away from, from blind choice and try to be guided by the objective standards of moral conduct. This is a bold statement. I want to point to and just underscore five quick points from this text. People as people have access to moral knowledge not mediated by religion or civil law, but intrinsic, innate, written on our hearts by God. Second, conscience inspires us to do good. Conscience isn't the, the, the old uh, caricature of a little angel and a little devil, and you know, the little devil always has the better argument, right? And, but, but conscience is um, what moves us to love God and neighbor. Conscience is where we are alone with God. Our conscience, then, is like being Moses at the burning bush. It's like Elijah trying to hear that still, small voice. Fourth, loyalty to conscience joins us to others, Christian and non-Christian, so that together we discern the moral truth. And finally, the end of conscience, its goal, isn't opinion, but truth. Ultimately, capital T truth, as it exists in the mind of God. Now, Conscience can be mistakenly uh, applied, uh, thought to be applied to specific actions. Uh, can I cross the street against the light? Can I cheat on my taxes? Perhaps not the best example to use the day after tax day, but still. In fact, though, conscience is far more holistic than that. It's not just about what we do. It's also about the kind of people we strive to be and to become in light of our most deeply held values. Conscience calls us to justice, to courage, to solidarity with the poor and outcast, not because those are extrinsic laws uh, put upon us arbitrarily. The virtues and values of well-formed conscience are the content of human flourishing. That's how we live best together and that, and that reflect that small voice echoing in our depths. It follows from all this, then, that we must never violate our conscience. 
After all, if after diligent prayer and study and consultation, our conscience tells us one thing, then to do the opposite is to go against what we believe is our best interpretation of God's voice echoing in our depths. It is always a sin. It always disrupts our relationship with God to violate conscience. As Joseph Ratzinger wrote in his commentary on Gaudium et Spes, quote, over the Pope as the expression of the binding claim of ecclesiastical authority, there still stands one's own conscience, which must be obeyed before all else, if necessary, even against the requirement of ecclesiastical authority, unquote. So here's the catch. None of us has direct, unmediated access to the mind of God. And since conscience is also a rational process of interpreting and applying the call we hear to our particular lives and situations, we can make mistakes in moral reasoning. Or we can make mistakes of fact about a particular situation and get off on the wrong foot altogether. So here we are, obliged to obey conscience, knowing that it reflects a whispered encounter with God's voice within us, and we know it can be wrong. This is where formation of conscience comes in. A well-formed conscience makes moral decisions better than a poorly formed conscience. Simple as that. Formation of conscience is like practice for a musician or an athlete. Serve a tennis ball at Serena Williams at 100 miles an hour, and she will hit it right back to you. Serve a tennis ball at me at 100 miles an hour, and I will duck and possibly scream. We get better with practice. Now, I don't have time to talk about resources for formation of conscience in any depth. That's a different lecture. What I want to just do here is to toss out a quick list of starter resources for formation of conscience. Prayer, still small voice, uh, still voice echoing in our depths, right? Study of scripture, study of science, history, philosophy, cultivating the moral imagination, including and perhaps especially through the arts, practices of social justice that reorient our social, our moral vision in line with that of Jesus, pondering the witness of saints, official saints and unofficial saints, who show us the way of Christ. The church's official teaching claims a privileged place in the Catholic moral repertoire too, since it represents our community's discernments across centuries. Know what the church teaches, and also know why and in what context those teachings arose, because sometimes through history, important, changes, uh, important teachings have developed or changed. It's also important to recognize that conscience is um, not an individual or isolated process. It's undertaken in community. Recall that line from Gaudium et Spes, through loyalty to conscience, Christians are joined to others in the search for truth. Our spiritual lives are communal. We gather to pray and to study and to encourage and persuade one another in the right course of action, especially on difficult questions. Related to this, conscience formation is a reciprocal process. We form and are formed in dialogue with others. Bernard Herring wrote, the uniqueness and creativity of conscience is not just for one's own sake. It is for co-humanity in and for the reciprocity of consciences. Hence, discernment concerns the common good in church and society and the good of each of our fellow men. We have to listen to the prophets, even if they shake us and unmask our errors. Because conscience is a reciprocal process. We are dependent on other people speaking their truths. Because conscience is a reciprocal process, we are responsible before God for speaking what we have gleaned of the voice that echoes in our depths. Probabilism. I warned you this is geeky, so buckle up. 
For a little context, let's go back to the 16th century. By the late 16th century, science was in a state of rapid development. Knowledge of the natural world was rapidly advancing. For example, a guy named Copernicus had upended the cosmos in 1543. The Protestant Reformation had demolished the church-state alliances that had ruled Europe. The New World was becoming a site not just of new colonization and new business opportunities, but of the discovery and rapid exploitation and widespread destruction of native peoples and their civilizations. The circling of the Catholic wagons at the Council of Trent both reaffirmed Catholic orthodoxy and reformed its institutions, hurling anathemas at those who would dissent. The counter-reformation lion Robert Bellarmine reaffirmed that in matters of doubt, what the Pope decrees is binding on Catholics. Quote, for in doubtful matters, the church is obliged to agree with the judgment of the Supreme Pontiff and do what he commands and not to do what he prohibits. And lest it should act against conscience, it is obliged to believe that good which he orders and that bad which he prohibits. There is a near parallel to this text in St. Ignatius of Loyola's rules for thinking with the church in his spiritual exercises. Quote, what seems to me white, I will believe black if the hierarchical church so defines. The Jesuit historian, marvelous Jesuit historian John O'Malley uh, interprets this passage in light of its last word, defines, what the church defines. And he means that in the theological sense. And O'Malley uses an example that what appears to us to be, may appear to us to be bread and wine, the church defines as the body and blood of Christ. O'Malley says, oh, this is Catholic orthodoxy, not blind obedience. But this notion of the priority of uh, official Catholic teaching on the conscience of Catholics isn't just a 16th century phenomenon. John Paul II's 1993 encyclical Veritatis Splendor includes this, quote, the magisterium does not bring to the Christian conscience truths which are extraneous to it. Rather, it brings to light the truths which it ought already to possess, unquote. So what's probabilism? The Dominican scholar Bartolomeo de Medina is credited with the first explicit statement of probabilism in his 1577 commentary on Thomas Aquinas' Summa, Theologi the Summa Theologiae on Thomas's question whether the will is good when it abides by erring reason. In other words, what if I do my best to figure something out and come to the wrong conclusion? Should I abide by my decision of conscience? Medina wrote, and I always imagine this as a marginal scribble, but in fact it wasn't a formal text, but it works well as a marginal scribble. Medina wrote, it seems to me that if an opinion is probable, it is licit to follow it, even though the opposite opinion is more probable. Now, Probable here means provable or capable of surviving a test or inquiry. According to Medina, a probable opinion is so because wise men propose it and confirm it by excellent arguments. This is important. Probabilism isn't trivial exception hunting, but requires good and solid reasons for thinking that a certain line of action is correct. Probabilism arose in a time in which moral theology was widely understood to be expressible in law-like dicta. When must we obey a rule, and when are we free to do what's contrary to it? So probabilism treads a field of moral consideration between perhaps unattainable total certainty and a shrugging relativism uh, that uh, abstains from serious moral consideration. There may be more than one probable position, but that doesn't mean that no moral distinctions can be made. For example, I used to ask my students what they would suggest was a reasonable response for a store owner who caught a 12-year-old kid shoplifting. Their answers tended to be both reasonable and compassionate. They had several probable approaches. 
feed him to the crocodiles, was never regarded as a good approach. There are many good ones. Doesn't mean there's not bad ones. The basic question of probabilism is set in the context of confession. What happens when the confessor's view of the rightness of an act is different from that of the penitent? Rudolf Schussler defines Medina's take on this. He says, he discusses the old case of a confessor wondering how to treat a penitent who has done something considered licit by many expert theologians, but regarded as illicit by the confessor himself. It is furthermore presumed that while the view of the confessor is probable, the opposite view is more so. Consider the case of a merchant. The merchant has traded in grain futures, as we would say today. It was controversial in the scholastic tradition whether such futures contracts were morally licit or not. Suppose the confessor believes that the arguments for illicitness predominate. In contrast, most experts in law or business ethics presume that the contract is licit. There are, however, enough reliable experts who support the confessor's view to make his position appear rationally tenable. Scholastic commentators on the conduct of confessors would therefore ascribe probability to both sides of the case." Unquote. Medina's comment in favor of granting leeway to any probable argument challenged the consensus at the time that the better reasons and the best experts must prevail. Striking here also is the observation that the category of reliable experts includes those who specialize in law or business and isn't limited to priests or even moralists. Medina's role as confessor is important. And in a time of exploding knowledge and destabilization of what had been the firm foundations of the ecclesiastical realm, no one, penitent or confessor, can be expected to know all the details of every moral question. And sometimes, to delay until moral certitude is, is reached, even if that's possible, is itself morally problematic, as is the case with business deals under time constraints, for example. But it's also true that in moral life, we are not required to achieve perfection, but to be the best that we can be in light of our own situations, talents, limitations, and even states of virtue and vice. We should always strive for moral rightness, and the prudential standard of probabilism sets us a standard that will at least put us on the path to virtue, even if we're not entirely there yet. It prevents the impossible challenge that one must either always be on the cutting edge of every relevant conversation in order to ever act, or even to be able to evaluate the credentials of everyone claiming expertise on a topic. This would be a relief for the penitent and the confessor as well, since the confessor's responsibility is to mediate mercy not to engage with expertise and insight for every possible facet of every penitent's concerns. But probabilism isn't limited only to matters of confession. Over time, natural law as well as civil law or religious law came to be seen as matter for probabilism. Natural law thinking includes, but isn't limited to, careful investigation of natural processes, aiming to glean moral insight. Where understanding of nature changes, then previously probable stances may become less so, or vice versa. Where science advances, then increases in the quality of the argument supporting a position increase its probability, or vice versa. The Jesuit moralist Joseph Fuchs wrote, quote, if some norms were formulated for realities fundamentally different from the realities that exist today, or with a fundamentally different understanding of those realities, the question arises whether a norm formulated in this way can be helpful or valid. Should it not be replaced by another norm? 
unquote. Now, probabilism was extraordinarily influential straight out of the gate with Spanish Jesuits among those spurring it on. Francisco Suarez and Gabriel Vasquez were among the most inf influential. Suarez developed his version of probabilism while lecturing on Thomas's Summa Theologiae at the Roman College in 1581. One of Suarez's contributions is crucial when considering doctrines under development. He defended Medina's basic assertion that a probable position may be held even if its contrary is more probable. First, following Medina, because a probable opinion is probable, that is, by definition, it's rational and affirmed at least by some experts. Suarez noted that a probable opinion possesses at least a semblance of truth. But Suarez also added an insight from Aristotle. He quoted book eight of Aristotle's topics to show that, quote, many falsehoods are more probable than the truth, unquote. In other words, in at least some cases, the less probable opinion might be the truer, even if the majority voices shout louder. For example, voices warning of environmental calamity from disastrous climate change used to be marginal. Now they're known to have been speaking the truth and rightly demand our urgent attention. For Suarez, uncertainty is intrinsic to moral life, and even less probable stances might represent truths as yet unadopted by experts and good arguments. Suarez affirmed, one general rule to use in all cases concerning doubts, uncertainties, and opinions, after considering all the different aspects of the specific issue, we must act so as to create the least amount of harm, given the demands and circumstances of the situation. Prudence, the virtue guiding the weighing of different options for action, must itself be guided by mercy. Now, Gabriel Vasquez, he distinguished intrinsic probability, where a position is upheld by good arguments, from extrinsic probability held by reliable authority. Yeah, remember the old uh, chewing gum ad, four out of five dentists surveyed say chew this kind of gum? That's extrinsic probability. For Vasquez, the uncertain nature of moral knowledge means that the opinion adopted by one's conscience is the more probable opinion. Otherwise, we would deliberately be doing what we think is less right. But Vasquez also emphasized the role of external influences, marshalling the voices of various authorities. But while he, intend, while he inclined toward the voices of, toward the opinions of venerable sources, Vasquez also noted that new information might render a more recent opinion more probable. For example, current research into the intellectual and emotional and even moral lives of animals are challenging long-standing attitudes that serve the interests of, among other things, factory farming. A probable opinion, extrinsically or intrinsically, may not remain equally probable forever. And indeed, over time, it might actually become improbable. For example, the presumption of scripture and much of Christian tradition is that heterosexuality is natural for all human beings and that behaving otherwise or claiming a non-straight sexual orientation was a matter of choice. The notion of orientation as choice is no longer tenable in light of relevant science, intrinsic probability, and experience, extrinsic probability. Okay, you still with me? Because these are the outlines of this theory. I promised you geekery, you got it. There were two extreme positions that were later condemned by ecclesiastical authority. Tutsirism, uh, which held that in situations of practical doubt, one should, sur one should choose the safer or tutsior position, granting obeisance to the law or norm. And when those were in conflict, the option less liable to lead one into sin. That's one extreme. The other extreme was laxism, which held that one could adopt even a very, very weak uh, argument or authoritative position. 
In circumstances which we might call moralists with too much time on their hands, some probabilists propose ridiculous things as probable. One example, now that we're through Lent, it's safe for me to use this example, is that on a fast day, it's perfectly fine to eat small amounts frequently as long as you never have a substantial meal. Clearly, an example of facile playing with an idea, not serious moral judgment. Ruling out laxism and tutsierism left two positions in the middle, probabilism and probabiliorism, Probabiliorism is the position that one must follow the stronger argument or the more influential experts. Um, and that dominated moral debates in the 18th century. The risk, though, of probabiliorism, you got to follow the more influential experts, is that you can drift into Tutsierism in that the way it's always been done is the way it's always going to be. That an extant law or opinion can get thereby an epistemological heft that it doesn't deserve. That's what Suarez noted in echoing Aristotle, that many falsehoods are more probable than the truth. Probabilism per se, as we saw in the case of the moralists with too much time on their hands, can drift into laxism unless one's paying attention. And while they tend toward opposite stances when you push them to extremes, uh, you don't have to think of probabilism and probabiliorism even as an either-or choice. Uh, ethicists Albert Johnson and Stephen Toulmin wrote, quote, Unfortunately, the moralists of the time saw the probabilist and probabiliorist views as exclusive options, whereas they can plausibly be understood to be alternatives for different situations. When faced with a complex issue that you have no chance to reflect on yourself, Accepting an opinion that appears reasonable from any sound doctor, probabilism, might be prudent practical policy. But if you have the time to undertake a fresh analysis of the issues, then the other probabiliorist course, which demands that you look for the sounder doctor and the more reasonable opinion, is surely preferable. Probabilism as a method was never condemned by ecclesiastical authority, although some mostly silly specific propositions were. Further, many of the principal defenders of probabilism were caught up in the attacks on and the eventual suppression of the Society of Jesus. But while the damage to probabilism was profound, along with casuistry, it waned, but it never quite disappeared. And then, in the 18th century, the patron saint of moral theology, Alphonsus Liguori, he renamed probabilism and restored its reputation, even if not its widespread practice. Liguori proposed in his moral theology the doctrine of equi-probabilism as an irenic compromise between probabilism and Tutsierism. As the term suggests, equiprobabilism says that the conscience is free when both arguments are about equal in terms of the rigor of the argument or the experts who hold it. But I tend to think of it more as like the term equipoise in research ethics. Equipoise requires a genuine uncertainty as to which course is better. You need to have equipoise in order to justify randomizing research participants into different treatment groups. At present, both probabilism and, probab and equiprobabilism are regarded as licit means of dealing with matters of doubt in morals. So who cares? You may be thinking that yourself. <laughs> so who cares? Why have I taken you on this deep dive into probabilism? Uh, especially in light of what I had said about conscience to start. First, I want to make the obvious point about probabilism. Catholic moral tradition has long noted the possibility of plural, plausible answers to difficult questions. In our divided times, too many people assert that Catholic tradition is somehow univocal and eternal, when in fact, it, the recognition that sometimes moral matters may be amenable to plural, acceptable positions is deep in our tradition. Sometimes we explicitly affirm that. One example, for example, is it's 
completely coherent with Catholic tradition either to hold a just war stance or a pacifist stance on the question of war. Now, there used to be a third option, right? It used to be that holy war was the third acceptable Catholic position toward war, and, uh, toward war in the church, but that's no longer regarded as probable. But today, in neuralgic issues, for example, almost any issue involving sexual ethics or women, the voices insisting that there can be only one truth, at least for Catholics, can be loud, and even if they are not or no longer persuasive. This recognition of moral pluralism in our tradition is good news for anyone who struggles with aspects of church teaching, even after diligent prayer and study and consultation. The one struggling is left with the question, is my stance probable, not what's wrong with me and do I have to leave the church? Second, probabilism is an important tool in the development of doctrine. Tradition has noted that answers can shift over time as new knowledge emerges. This, uh, that is, when there is an increase in what Vasquez called intrinsic probabilism. This is good news for the tradition. We are not required to cling to old ways of thinking because church tradition affirmed, for example, that slavery is okie doke or that women are less rational than men. I also see in probabilism an opportunity to cultivate several virtues for moral life. And I'm gonna conclude by a few words about several of these. Epistemological humility, curiosity, skepticism, focus on imagination, and ultimately trust. Epistemological humility. The virtue of humility doesn't require us to belittle ourselves or to deny our strengths. Like any virtue in the Aristotelian tradition, it's a mean between two vices. Just as courage is a mean between cowardice and stupidly rushing into danger, humility is a mean between a kind of prideful self-focus that belittles everything that isn't me and an excessive self-abasement that, that is also wrong. Epistemological humility requires both that we listen well to truths others hold and also that we bring into dialogue what we have gleaned as we attend to God's voice echoing in our depths. Remember, not law, but grace. We are invited to think about our decisions of conscience as moments of grace operating through our necessarily finite and fallible human reason. Too often in our time, people use conscience as a way to stop a discussion. No, my conscience says no. But think about it. If we've done the hard, spiritual, and rational, and consultative work of conscience formation, then we should want to discuss our discernments with those who disagree. A claim of conscience should never be a last word, but should be a first word to a dialogue between people of goodwill. Curiosity. Curiosity reminds us to expand the range of who count as experts. Just like back in the day, it was experts in business who, had to, who, were, um, who were thought of as probable in the penitent confessor relationship, right? Remember that um, if another stance is probable, it's licit to hold it. Now, what this does for us now is it allows for important differences that expertise and point of view can bring. Ethical issues may look different to men than to women, to straight people than to LGBTQ people, to people of color than to whites, to the poor than to the rich, and on and on. The insights of liberation theologies are helpful here. Oppressors of oppression of others oppresses everybody. Liberation of others reveals the contours of God's liberating spirit. As James Cone wrote, to know God is to know God's work of liberation on behalf of the oppressed. God's revelation means liberation, an emancipation from death-dealing political, economic, and social structures of society. This is the essence of biblical revelation 
There is no revelation of God without a condition of oppression which develops into a situation of liberation. Revelation is only for the oppressed of the land." Unquote. Now, if we take seriously the role of conscience as seeking, ultimately, capital T truth, then we have to make sure our moral deliberations are as broadly consultative as possible. Extrinsic probabilism, the voice of experts in the matter at hand, must include the voices of all people striving to live their lives with integrity. Curiosity of this kind is the beginning of solidarity, the beginning of coming together with others in pursuit of justice for all. And this is why, for example, the synodal conversations held so far have been so important. A synodal church is a church together discerning the call of God for us. It started with conversations and questions of what Catholics believe are the critical questions facing our church today. That's curiosity in action. Skepticism. Since conscience seek truth, seeks truth, it is always wrong to reject what one knows or believes after appropriate investigation to be true. We've covered that. Skepticism reminds us that it's also wrong to assert as true what is not known to be true. And this is where probabilistic plurality shines. Where there is legitimate doubt, the seeker after capital T truth asks another question, expands the range of voices heard, prays again, lets the matter sit unsettled. Skepticism is the enemy of sloppy moral reasoning and also the enemy of grandiose, of grandiose moral claims that just won't hold water. Imagination. Probabilism requires us to develop and cherish our moral imagination. Just as Jesus spoke of the reign of God in imaginative terms, it's like a mustard seed, it's like yeast in dough, it's like a pearl of great value. None of those are instructions. Those are invitations to imagine. Probabilism invites us to expand our vision to imagine new moral worlds. I just got an, just before I came here, I got an email invitation to a, a synod, a, a synod, a conversation on earth justice with the subtitle, what's possible? What a great invitation. Another example, we know that St. Ignatius began his transformation from courtier to spiritual guide when he asked himself, you know, what, what would happen if I tried to be like St. Francis, like St. Dominic? He had to translate what that meant into the situation of his own life and ultimately revealed in himself a kind of pilgrim sanctity that has also shaped Roman Catholic tradition. In a sense, the multiplicity of holy lives, as, as different as the colors in a stained glass window, show us a pluralism of probable ways to follow Jesus. Boldness. Following conscience can be hard. Further, there are times when others' claims of conscience are not merely different from our own, but outright wrong and hurtful and harmful. Whites in the Jim Crow South were confident that their racist ways were not just right, but Christian. The Klan didn't burn crosses to mock Christianity, but to assert that they were the true believers. The witness of those who stood against them and worked for change illustrates that there are limits to probabilism. Suarez noted that right, act, the right acts must cause the least harm. Sure, but more. Where there is injustice, the echo of the voice of God in our depths demand that we act against it. As this quote that's been attributed to James Baldwin says, we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. Sometimes we need to choose which side we're on and mercy and kindness are always probable. And finally, trust. Remember where we started not law, but grace. 
Grace is the self-communication of God, always carrying with it an offer of salvation. In conscience, we strive more and more to attend to that echo in our hearts that tells us inwardly, do this, shun that. Christian conscience and its attendant practice of probabilism invite us into dialogue with other people of goodwill, knowing that none of us possesses the fullness of truth, but that all of us are called into the work of the reign of God together. Part of our work is to trust the one who calls us and to trust our companions of goodwill who will help us discern, even if what we discern is that there's more than one right answer in the moral gray zones of our lives. We are, each of us, finite and fallible and called exactly as finite and fallible to humility and curiosity and skepticism, to imagination and boldness, grounded not in our own power, but in the power of one who entered into dialogue with disciples on the road to Emmaus, explaining the truth to them as they went and revealing himself in the breaking of the bread. Thank you. <laughs>